So at one point or another, you got yourself an action camera, assuming that now your life would look something like this. When in reality, it actually ended up looking something more like this. Oh, hi, Petey. Now, I can't really help you with the crashing part, but I can help you with the camera part. So I am really, really excited to get this video out for you guys. You know, with my channel, The Lone Ranger, I have been traveling the world, riding the best trails out there and telling some pretty fun stories along the way. And because it's just the nature of my channel, you know, 95% of my footage comes from these little guys, action cameras. And if you notice, I'm holding a Hero 4. And this one's a couple generations old, but we'll talk about that in a minute. It's like, why is he holding one of these and not using one of the newer ones? I will show you. And so with my professional photography background, I've kind of been able to have that inside look on how to actually leverage these little guys. It doesn't take much, but it takes a, a few little tweaks to the camera and the way you shoot and what you do afterwards to get that kind of quality. And I'm gonna show you how to do all of it in this series. So hit the subscribe button, hit the bell next to it so that you can be notified of the second video in the series because I've got so much to cover. I'm not gonna be able to fit it all into one video. So make sure you tune in for that. Okay, so first things first, let's go over the actual camera itself. Now, if you've bought any action camera from one of the major manufacturers within the last, I don't know, three or four years, you've got a good quality camera that could put out nice results, okay? Whether that's GoPro or Sony or Garmin or whatever. So this is the camera that I happen to use. Come on over this way. All right, so this camera here is my GoPro Hero 4 Black. This is my main camera that I shoot pretty much everything with. This poor thing has clearly seen some stuff in its life. Sorry, GoPro. <laughs> but it works really, really well, and there are a couple of huge reasons why I use this camera over some of the newer ones, like the Hero 5 or the Hero 6, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the checklist that I need for an action camera are that it shoots in 4K at 24 frames per second. For me, I don't do slow-mo and stuff when it comes to GoPros, so I don't need the 4K 60 of the brand new ones. Um, this camera here, little tip that we'll talk about later, has just incredible audio quality if it's not in that wretched waterproof housing. But the biggest overall factor that has me deciding whether I'm gonna buy this action camera or that action camera is the ability to control all of the settings myself. Anytime a camera is left to its own devices, it's gonna make basically the worst possible decisions. I've found in my decade of being a professional photographer, it doesn't matter how fancy or expensive the camera is, they're, they're pretty dumb. And with this camera, I have a thing called ProTune and it really sets it up quite nicely for me to plug in the settings that I want to get the best possible starting footage. All right, so this all leads into crucial tip number one, which is never, ever, 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 ever let your camera choose the settings for you. It is always a mistake every single time. Now it can seem pretty daunting to dig into all those different menus and choose white balance and frame rate and field of view and all this kind of stuff, but I'm gonna break it down really quickly, really easily so that you can plug in the settings and head out on the trail and get some great footage. And I'm gonna show you the difference between auto mode and plugging in your own settings right now. All right, so check this out. This is a shot of me on my bike in full auto mode. And here's a shot where I entered in the settings I wanted, which actually looks, it looks better, but it still looks flat. But then I go ahead and I post-process it. I color correct it after the fact. And then when I'm done, it looks like this. So this is the key to all of it. It's setting your camera up so that it can take in as much image data as possible so that you have all of that, all those highlights and shadows to work with after the fact. Okay, so contrast. Contrast is a really big hurdle for action cameras because out of the box, GoPro and Sony or whoever pretty much always ramps up the contrast. So anytime you're in a situation where it's already high contrast, wherever you're at, and that means like really bright highlights and really dark shadows, like, you know, if there was full sunshine out, but you were biking under tree cover and you have all those shadows and highlights kind of peeking through, that's a very high contrast situation. And I'm sure you've seen what I'm talking about. You've seen videos out there or maybe your own where somebody's riding along and you basically can't see what they're doing because there's just, it's just dark shadow 
and super bright highlights and you can't actually make out what exactly is going on, which is no fun. We wanna dial down the contrast in such a way that we can put in just the right amount later on. And with GoPro, that means setting it into the ProTune flat setting. So I'm gonna use my phone app here and I'll show you the screen and how I set it up. So I'm gonna change some settings here and pay close attention because there's some really important things that I'm about to do. All right, so first, um, video mode obviously. Resolution, uh, I'm gonna go into 4K Super View. 4K Super View basically is pumping the maximum amount of resolution I can through this camera. And Super View is a, is a kind of kind of an extra wide angle. It's using the absolute maximum from the image sensor itself. And that's what I want. So frames per second, I am all about my 24 frames per second or 23.9, whatever, whatever. It's a very cinematic look. As soon as I, as soon as you go to 30 frames per second, which comes standard on most cameras, um, it just looks, I don't know, it looks like a daytime television. Whereas 24 frames, it looks cinematic, it looks good, I love it. So 24 frames per second for me. So here's the biggest thing right here, we're gonna go and hit ProTune. Now as soon as you hit ProTune, it opens up all these options, and you've probably seen this. This is where you can choose things like white balance, and EV comp, and sharpness, and all these sorts of things. So choosing your white balance is one of the most important things you can do for your camera. So instead of being an auto mode for white balance, we are gonna choose our white balance. And so for me, I'm gonna choose 6500 Kelvin. And basically what I'm doing is, because of the, the test situation that we have set up, it's a cloudy day and 6500 or 6000, because I know with the newer firmware as you can do 6000 Kelvin, it's really great for cooler looking days. For 5500 Kelvin, when you see that, that's daylight balance. So when it's like sunshine, no clouds covering the sun, that's the kind of white balance you want. And 6500, that's if it's overcast or cloudy. Um, you want that to warm up the image a little bit. Now, next up, do not choose GoPro Color for color. GoPro Color is like mega saturation and contrast, and you do not want that in either case. So we're gonna go to flat. Very, very, very crucially important. ISO limit, leave it at 6400. Sharpness I put to low, because I wanna do my own sharpening after the fact. And EV comp to minus one, so you can dial it to wherever. You're basically telling the camera to always underexpose a little bit by one EV. And so what that's gonna do, it's gonna save the highlights of the image. So it's not gonna overexpose all the brightest parts of the image, it's gonna save that detail so that I can work on it afterwards. And that's it. This is my, this is my camera setup right here. So when it comes to color, any camera when it sees, you know, a whole bunch of green, it thinks, well, why is there so much green in this photo or this video right now? I need to get rid of all that green. And so it adds in red, adds in blues, it basically tries to take out a bunch of green so it can balance out the color. But the problem is, a lot of times we're off in the woods and there's green everywhere. Like here's me in the woods with green budding trees all over the place wearing a green shirt. So this is on uh, kind of a standard mode that you would have your GoPro on when you first get it. And um, it's in auto white balance and all those sorts of things. So this is what it looks like. Now let's compare that to where I set my own white balance of 6500 Kelvin. This is what it looks like. And now these are with my pro, this is with ProTune on and my settings dialed in. So you can see this, well, I can tell you, you wouldn't actually know, but I can tell you that this is how the scene actually looks. Whereas before, it was kind of like washed out and like had these reddish, bluish hues going on. When this now captures the green properly and it's kind of an overcast day. So it's, yeah, this is how it looks. You just have to tell these little things what to do and they do pretty good job at it. Okay, so next up is actual camera placement. Now this makes a really big deal as well. The first thing I wanna bring up is that I find most people tend to do a helmet cam. They either have it connected on the side of their helmet or up on top of their helmet like that. Now, that can work okay in some circumstances, but I find, and especially for the kind of footage that I tend to wanna to get, the lower the camera is, the better. Or at least where the most action is happening, that's where you want your camera angle to be. Another huge aspect of camera placement is a perception of speed. Now we want all of our videos to look as fast as it felt, which is really hard to do, right? In the best case scenario. But the one big thing to keep in mind is, let's say you're looking up in the sky at a jet flying way up there. Now that thing is going really, really fast. Like 
six or 700 kilometers an hour. I'm from Canada, take it easy. But when you're looking at it, because it's so far away, it looks like it's barely moving at all, right? Moving across the sky very slowly. And on the other side of it, if you had something that was even going like sort of relatively slowly, if it was going right past your face, it looks like it's going a lot faster than it really is. So that's that whole kind of like distance versus speed perception thing. So the closer your camera can be to what's moving past it, the faster it will look. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Here's a shot with me uh, with my camera on top of my head. So quite far away from the ground and far away from my arms and my bike and, and uh, you know, the, the trees on the sides that are going around. Now when I drop the camera lower down to my chest, right about here, now all of a sudden it's much closer to the ground and so the ground rushing past it is captured a lot more. Another big part of that is having that super view wide as possible angle. I find it works best, especially when it's chest mounted, because now you're catching all the trees, even that are right up beside your handlebars or whether you're you know, skiing through the woods or whatever, it also catches the ground right below you too. And so by the time the, the trees or the ground or the snow is right below you, it's gonna look like it's going by really, really fast. So you almost have this like Star Trek going into warp speed kind of effect that you just can't get if it's way up top on your head. It's just too far removed from the action. So for me and what I do, chest mount all the way. Now one thing you probably noticed was a huge difference between uh, the sample footage where um, it was sort of like the stock configuration compares to the way I have things set up is the sound. The sound that I get from my setup is just light years ahead of the standard setup. Now what I'm talking about with that is one, the worst thing that ever happened to a GoPro is that waterproof housing. If you are not submerging it and if it's not absolutely pouring rain, you do not need that waterproof housing. Um, take it out of there. And this little microphone on this camera is, is beautiful. It actually does an incredible, incredible job of picking up all the little noises around you and your own voice. It's I'm actually really impressed with that mic. Now the only trouble with that is that if it gets windy, it picks up wind noise a fair amount. But what I do is I head on down to the dollar store and I pick up some fake moustaches and I cut off, I actually have to do this right now. So I'm basically just like figuring out the amount of mustache I want on the camera. Ow, I know how to use scissors, I swear. And they usually have a sticky backing. Sometimes I'll add some double-sided tape that's a little bit stronger than this, but we'll throw it on here for now. Boop. Cut that off. There we go. Oh, I'm such a professional. There, got it. So he's got a little hairdo now, looking nice. And this really helps um, deaden the wind, which is awesome. And if it gets really, really crazy windy, I have this like little foam sort of sock that goes over it, and that cuts out pretty much all wind noise whatsoever. And that's just like a little piece of foam that I just slide over top, nothing crazy. Now you might be saying to yourself, self, I have a Hero 5 or a Hero 6, and those already come waterproof and there's no exterior sort of case for it. So my audio should be good. Well, I hate to tell you, but the biggest reason why I use this camera still is audio. Um, those other cameras, the Hero 5 and the Hero 6, have multiple microphones all over it and the, it, it just sounds really, really, really bad in pretty much every single situation. When you're trying to actually waterproof something, but then have audio to be able to be captured by a microphone, there's just no real way of having a, well, a good sounding waterproof microphone on a camera. So that, that is the biggest reason why I still use this camera. Focus. There we go, okay. So this, is my chest mount kind of harness thing that I wear. It just goes over like that, snaps together, and there we go. Now from here, okay, so there's this big old electronic elephant in the room that we need to cover, and that is the gimbal. This is made by a company called um, Juntech, I think, Juntech. Um, it's a three axis wearable gimbal, and that goes right onto my chest mount right there. Don't I look cool? And then, the GoPro, whoop, rip, rip, rip. I'm not giving you the finger, I'm just, maybe I'm doing, but no, I'm not giving you the finger. It goes on here, hold down the button, the gimbal will start up, and then now, I have a nice, state. here, I'm gonna take this off so you can see it a little bit better. I have a stabilized camera, just like this. Ooh, look at that. 
and it keeps it really nice and smooth. You guys have seen this on, you know, iPhone uh, gimbals and things like that, or the bigger, the bigger gimbals. This is just the same thing, but it's just small enough and compact enough that I can wear it while flying down a mountain on my mountain bike. Having this setup like this allows me to not have the case over top of the GoPro Hero 4, and as you've seen, it's very important to not have that on there. The microphone is right there underneath my chin, so when I'm talking, it can hear me really clearly. And then when it's like super rough on the trail, this smooths it out really, really nicely. Now these gimbals might seem like they're super expensive, but they're not. They've actually come down in price a fair amount. So you can get a nice professional gimbal like this one for about 250 bucks, give or take which is pretty freaking fantastic when you consider what it does. And you know, I have crashed on these things, I've sweat all over it, it's been rain and mud on it, and it always works, well, I shouldn't say perfectly because you know what, they have pro their problems as well. But for the most part, I can't believe how well they work considering what I've put them through. So gimbals, if you really want nice smooth footage, whether it's chest mounted or on a pole, you know, holding it out, snowboarding or whatever, um, gimbals really do make a huge difference. So now, by the end of this video, you should have um, your settings dialed in, whether that's GoPro or not, into the flattest, least sharp image possible, which sounds totally counterintuitive, but you've got the camera uh, looking good, collecting as much data as you can at the highest resolution you can. You've got the camera in the right place to capture the most amount of action. Now, what do you do with it? <laughs> We're gonna cover that in the next video. I'm gonna show you the program that not only is, for most professional colorists would say, the world's best color grading software. And it happens to be a great editing software. And, and the one program that I have used since the very beginning of my channel for every single video. It is a fantastic program and it also happens to be free. Yes, unless you need uh, like 10 different people working from the same software platform and sharing all this stuff back and forth, they don't charge you a dime for it. So I'm gonna show you what that is. And I'm gonna also go over how I take that base level footage that we have and turn it from this to this. I can't wait to show you guys. So make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, leave some comments if you have some other things you'd want me to show. And I will see you then. Cheers, everybody.